Um, good evening, everybody. Um, it is uh, exactly seven o'clock, so we're starting right on time. <clears throat> uh, thanks for coming to this special program with author Amy uh, Ostriker. My name is Michael Pieri, and I'm a librarian at the Hampton Public Library. Um, before we get started, uh, I just wanted to remind uh, everyone to check out some of our upcoming online programs. Uh, next week, we have two webinars for small business owners and entrepreneurs. Um, there's How to Finance Your Small Business at uh, 1 o'clock on Monday the 22nd, and uh, Creating Web Content at 10 a.m. on Thursday the 25th. Um, also, uh, in the evening, 7 p.m. that same day, uh, we're going to be having our Zoom open mic, which is our, our third one that we've had so far, and those are always a lot of fun. Uh, visit our website, handinlibrary.org, and then click on online events, and then you can read more and register for these and, and other upcoming programs that we have. Um, and one more thing before I uh, introduce Amy. Um, just wanted to lay down a, a few, a couple of quick ground rules. Um, you'll notice you're going to be all on mute for the duration of this event. Um, there is going to be a, a little Q and A period at the end, about 10 minutes or so. Um, so if you have any questions, like just jot them down and then save them for the end. And I think we'll open up chat and let you uh, send them at the end there. Um, and now. I want to introduce our uh, special guest for the evening. Uh, Amy Ostriker is many things, artist, writer, motivational speaker. Uh, she's the author of the Connecticut Press award-winning me uh, memoir, My Beautiful Detour, An Unthinkable Journey from Gutless to Grateful. Tonight, she's here to share with us some creative resilience strategies she's developed over the course of her own journey as a detourist. Uh, so without further ado, please join me in welcoming Amy Ostriker. Take it away. <laughs> Thank you, Michael. Um, good evening, everyone. <laughs> Welcome to my virtual <laughs> author talk. Um, so I, I'm excited to do this now, um, especially now because um, this has been a very uncertain time for all of us. Um, many of us feel like we're in this kind of uh, stagnant period uh, and we don't know when things are going to change. And we hear a lot of things about um, things reopening and things going back to normal. And we all want things to go back to our normal life, but there is no real guarantee of anything. And when we do go back to that, obviously, um, we will have been changed for our experience. And I was thinking about how I'm making it through day to day and how we all are trying to make it one day at a time with no definite end um, in sight. And I can't help but think about how this is something I really had to learn myself years ago when I was 18, um, coming into a completely new world um, where I didn't have an endpoint in sight. Um, that's what I wanted to share with you, how I got through. Uh, that's the story of my memoir, <laughs> My Beautiful Detour. And um, I wanted to talk with you about it and also um, share some of the tools. Um, I'm going to briefly talk about um, some of the strategies and exercises, um, but I will email anyone um, the full packet of these worksheets and exercises uh, for anyone that does uh, get a copy uh, tonight um, of the book. Um, so um, here we go. I, I have a little PowerPoint since I'm not there in person. Um, so um, yeah, uh, let's see. So yeah. Um, five months ago, which was, you know, January, February ish, um, think about what you were telling yourself, who you were, what your home is. I believe the world is. Who knew that everything would change 
seemingly <laughs> overnight, or maybe uh, to us, it felt like something drastically uh, flipped on its head overnight. Um, so <laughs> what if you woke up one day and your answers were forever changed? Um, you kind of felt like that. And that is really literally how I felt um, with my story. Um, I'm 33 now, but this was my uh, high school uh, graduation picture. Um, many of you know teenagers and college students and many students who are having a very uh, atypical um, graduation. And mine was certainly atypical because this is walking the beautiful hallways of um, Columbia Presbyterian ICU. Um, apparently, I was their only high school uh, graduation ceremony in the surgical ICU, which was very unexpected to me. Um, and that's uh, where I'm, I'm going to start. Eventually, um, I wrote a show about it, um, which is this last picture here. But um, it took a few detours to, to get to that point. <laughs> uh, oh, there's my screen. Um, but um, what good story doesn't have a detour? Um, so pandemic aside, who hasn't had something unexpected in, in their life, whether it be uh, getting lost, uh, walking around, or uh, a, new, uh, a new show you didn't expect to see on, on TV? Um, you know, there are small detours, there are long detours. Um, and how many of us have had times where we're not really sure uh, where, where our path is going? Um, and that's what a detour is to me. Um, so, so my detour started, um, by the way, this is all art I created many years later. Art was a, never an interest of mine growing up and, and a beautiful, surprising flower on my detour, which I'll, I'll get into later. But for now, it's illustrating my journey. So growing up, um, I saw creativity everywhere. Um, I love musical theater uh, mostly because I loved bringing these stories I'd read to life. Um, I was very inspired by the hidden life all around me, which I saw in nature, in trees. Um, and now that uh, we've been in quarantine, I have lots of time for those nature walks and, and finding that hidden life and, and inspiration. But, but th that was my world and trees were really how I found my foundation and, and guidance. Um, trauma hit um, when I was um, 17. Um, I had was studying with a, a voice teacher who became my mentor at the age of 15 in New York. Um, and he really became a very big uh, role in my life, um, especially for someone so driven uh, towards musical theater. And then when I was 17, you know, I was sexually abused by him for a period of months. And I froze, I went out of body, which is a term I wouldn't understand till many years later. But for me, I just knew something had shifted in me and I wasn't really sure. And later on when I discovered art, I was finally able to really um, express what it felt like. It felt like some something in, within me had changed from, you know, you see red to blue and, and then also this painting on the right, this sense of numbness that everything, I was suddenly in a fog and I, I didn't know what to attribute it to. Um, I kept that secret inside um, for months until I really felt like something within me was just violently wrong. And finally, I could put words to it. And I told my mom um, the April of my senior year um, around my 18th birthday, which was April 10th, 2005. And then um, two weeks later, uh, my stomach had developed a very big blood clot. And I experienced that as a ton of pain. I was rushed to the emergency room and my stomach had ruptured. Um, and I was um, in the emergency room when surgeons cut into me, there was so much internal pressure that my stomach had exploded. And I was 
in a coma at 18. And this was a week after I had gotten my college acceptance letters and I thought I was going to study musical theater. Um, and I was driven and I knew exactly what I wanted to do. I'm sure there were, there are many uh, high school seniors out there that applied way back um, at the beginning of the year and thought they were going right ahead. Um, and my, my world was completely in flux. So when I woke up months later, um, first thing I wanted to know was, well, aren't I going to college? Uh, what, what's going on? Um, I'd never really been in a hospital before, so I didn't understand why I could only see the ceiling. And um, suddenly I had no strength anymore when in, in my head, I was just in dance class like a, a few weeks before. Um, and then I'll get to that. But then doctors finally told me what had happened after I'd been there and acclimated to the ICU a few after a few months um, when they said I didn't have a stomach anymore and I couldn't eat or drink. And they just didn't know when that would happen again or if um, it would happen again. So the first thing you want to know when you hear something devastating like that is when give me a date, give me a time, or give me a guarantee. Uh, tell me that I can eat at least. But, but there was none of that. Um, so coming out of the hospital, um, I was hoping for at least some kind of certainty or to feel like I was somewhat in my old life. But um, it was the same uncertainty uh, back in the world. I had to just play the waiting game at home on nutritional IVs um, with you know tubes and bags coming out of me, um, wondering when that day would happen that I could eat and drink and just be normal again, have my own strength and and feel like myself. Uh, nothing nothing felt the same. Uh, so how did I get through? Um, because shooting ahead, it turned into about six years unable to eat or drink anything um, and 28 surgeries. So at that time, I knew none of that. And I always think to myself, if I knew it had been that long, I would have given up. But all I had was the idea that, okay, maybe um, it will happen soon. It will happen soon. Um, and so how I got through from that moment to moment, day to day of total uncertainty, I, oh, there goes my screen again. I realized way in retrospect um, that it was um, four skills that I, I boiled down to. And when I tell people the names of these four skills, you know, gratitude, creativity, hope, and stories, they seem like really cheesy, just like big words you see on like the posters at Home Goods. <laughs> but um, they were really all I had. I I didn't really have any kind of formal you know therapy because I couldn't afford to talk about my feelings because anything I really felt would make me feel hunger. And so I had to stay relatively numb to get through um, being at home in the real world and not even being able to have an ice cube. Um, so I really had to resource whatever I had around me. Um, and so all I had were these basic things. And so I'm, I'm going to you know, talk a little bit about how each of these steps um, how I incorporate them from, from day to day. Um, so <laughs> this, was, this was one of my biggest detours after my coma detour. This was um, 13 surgeries later um, and three years after I was 21 and I finally had an operation where I thought I would be able to eat again and I could eat um, for about a week. But the surgery didn't work very well and um, my wound exploded and it took another three years before surgeons could work out something else. So I'm just bringing this up now because sometimes we overcome one detour and another detour sprouts out of that. I think we realized that 
you know, detours are never ending. Our lives are made of all of these winding paths and detours. So these four skills are mindsets that we really have to keep practicing again and, and again and build it in our muscle memory. Um, just like now, I'm, I'm practicing these skills as we wait for, for things to shift. Um, so my first skill is hope. Um, and hope, um, hope is an interesting word. Um, you can find a lot of inspirational quotes about hope. Um, but I found that hope isn't just this lovely beam of light that, that comes to you when you just say, okay, um, I'm, I'm hopeful. It's, it's making us feel something that we don't really feel um, authentically. Uh, hope you have to actively work for. It's a job. Um, you have to actively cultivate hope. Um, you have to create it. And an example of that is um, when you read um, a fiction story um, or a, a fairy tale, you're only going to believe that Little Red Riding Hood um, you know, talk to a wolf if you practice um, willing suspension of disbelief. Um, you have to tell yourself that you are creating a lie. Um, and an example for me is, you know, when I'm discharged from the hospital and no one is telling me anything, um, if it's even possible to hook up my digestive system again, what I ended up doing was I wrote big numbers on, on my wall in my room and said seven days till I can eat again. Then I did six days, five days. And when it got to zero, I just restarted at seven, six, five, four. And I did that for years and years. And just seeing those numbers go down was a way that I could give myself hope. And I, I think of that like an athlete, um, running a marathon and just seeing the finish line, you know, right ahead. Um, so it was something I had to keep creating. And that hope is the fuel that kept me going from day to day. And that's the truth of, of getting through any, you know, really big detour in life is you just have to see the next day or the next moment. Um, so that was how hope really helped me. Um, and you have to create your own hope. I, many people are like, how did you do this? But for one of the times that I couldn't eat, because that was another unfortunate thing on my detour, I, I would be hooked up to eat and then some other surgery would go wrong and suddenly I would be unable to eat for one or two years or three months or, you know, eating became like a switch. I would have to turn on and off. And for one of those times, I was so hungry and I didn't want to let go of the idea of food that I turned to cooking and being with those smells and tastes and textures was a way I could visualize that for myself and believe that that would happen um, in the future. Um, so just one of the many ways, but you really have to think to yourself, how can I create an, just enough hope to get me till tomorrow or just till the next hour? Um, and you know, you don't, you don't think of the end point, uh, cause who knows what the end point is? Uh, okay. Number two, which is kind of the all encompassing, um, skill too, but, but so important, uh, creativity. So I've always been a theater kid and consider myself creative, but you don't have to consider yourself an artist or into creative arts um, to, to be creative. Um, creativity is a mindset. It's how we look at something and in a different way. It's a great way to problem solve and, and think out of the box. Um, so we need creativity as a mindset to help us look at something in our lives that might appear um, as an obstacle or not what you expected and, and see it as an opportunity. Um, and I mentioned earlier during you know, my 13th surgery, that was supposed to be the biggie that was finally supposed to get me to eat. Um, and it was a big disaster. So I was in California 
um, a few weeks after my surgery when my wound exploded and I was air vac back to Yale Hospital where I had gotten that surgery. Um, and I was suddenly surrounded by surgeons and doctors that were racking their brains trying to figure out how to fix this wound that they had worked so hard to to heal you know there was no manual for this um my anatomy is kind of a, an anomaly so it was very scary for me now back to being in patient mode seeing doctors who you want to have faith that they'll fix it see doctors not really know what to do and i was angry because you know eating was this promise made to me um, finally when I got this surgery and I, and I was ready to just relax already and enjoy my life. And now I was back to square one. So I, I was pissed and I was done with the resilient skill of hope. Um, so I needed something else. Um, and I remember, you know, the exact moment I discovered painting for the first time. Um, I was lucky enough to have my mother staying with me for all those months in the Yale ICU. And she was just buying things from the hospital gift shop just to give us both something to do. And she had gotten a crafts, uh, a kid set of paints and canvases. And I remember one morning when the doctors came in for rounds, and, you know, they come in at an insanely early time where you really don't want to be bothered. Um, and I remember waking up like a half hour before them at like 4.30 in the morning and thinking, I can't do this anymore. I was feeling something and I didn't know what I was feeling, but it, it wasn't a good feeling. Um, and I realized in retrospect, it, it was anger. But... At that time, I was just so frustrated, feeling so stifled and, and locked in, um, cabin fever, like many of us are, are feeling now. And I just remember feeling this energy and just picking up one of those paintbrushes, which I had stubbornly avoided, and thinking, I have no idea what I'm doing, but I feel like I can't control anything. So whatever I'm feeling, I'm just going to put it into this paintbrush. And I remember just like slamming it on, on the canvas for the first time. And that, that was my discovery of, of art. Um, that's how I created um, this one, Singing Tree. Um, that was the first painting I ever made in that hospital. And <clears throat> suddenly it was a way to express whatever I was feeling. I wasn't really sure what it was. I couldn't articulate it. But by the end of the painting, I felt like something had changed. Um, and I, I had found some, some kind of voice. Um, and that creativity was, was my container. Um, so, um, and, and that's the painting, um, Singing Tree. And what that showed me about the transformative power of art is we can feel such terrible things. Um, and then once we take that energy and do something where it moves through us, uh, we can find some kind of release. And in the end, you know, years later in this painting, people only see this happy tree. And, um, and that's what art does. It's a way we can really be with those ugly feelings because we can't avoid them. You're always very honest with that grief and anger as I was painting. And yet it was not swallowing me or eating me up alive. You know, I was at a safe distance away from it. So we all need to find, uh, why do I keep doing, we all need to find some creative uh, resource. Um, so, so that energy that I talked about, um, that angry energy, that uncertain energy, um, fear, uncertainty, like any terrible thing like that, once I was able to reframe that as energy, it became this thing I could hold in my hand and I, I could do something with and actively move through me. You know, I didn't have to run away from grief or anger or repress that emotion. Um, we're all told, you know, don't, you know, you, know, you should 
feel your feelings and or hopefully we're told that um but sometimes that sadness or those you know not so joyful feelings they're they're hard to experience um but when i was able to kind of reframe that as energy um it really became a great tool so i you know want to take a second um wherever you are now uh I don't know if you are able to stand up where you are or at least stretch out your arms, but do something where you're feeling uh, where you are in this space right now and, and in your body. Um, I like to imagine energy as, as a certain color. Um, so everyone, if we could all just take one deep inhale and exhale. I'll do it with you because I need to breathe. And as we're exhaling, imagine that exhale has a certain color and a certain path and shape as it comes out of us, whether our nose or our mouth. And now if you can see that energy coming from your shoulder to your elbow, and then your elbow to your wrist, and then your wrist out your fingers. and feel what that energy feels like. Is it warm? Is it tingly? Is it itchy? And, and that, that is your energy. Um, and there are many physical forms of energy. There are many thinking forms of energy. So now I'm gonna say how I use that energy um, to really um, transform all the yucky feelings I, I was feeling. Um, for anyone who knows the basic law of energy, you know, energy and matter can't be created and, or it cannot be um, destroyed. Um, so whatever we're feeling, if we try to numb out to it or run away from it or deny it or pretend we're not feeling something, it's just gonna come back in, a, in another form. Um, so we really have to um, own and accept whatever feelings we're feeling. You know, listen, none of us are happy about this um, pandemic. Um, so um, we really have to find joy by first accepting um, all those angry and, and unpleasant feelings because those feelings are going to come up on, on any detour. Um, and for me, creativity was a great way I could come to know those feelings in a safe way and then uh, move through them. Um, so um, this is uh, the first step that I, I did to, uh, to really get to know that energy. I, I call them in my imaginary world, my five superhero senses. And your five senses just help you be present wherever you are uh, right here, right now. Um, so whenever I was feeling anxious or uncertain, I just tried to focus on where am I in this moment right now? Because really in this moment, wherever we are in this instant, everything can potentially be good. It's when we start thinking about the bigger picture that maybe we get anxious or upset. So at this very second, see if you can name the first thing that you think of. The first thing that you smell, see, touch, taste, hear. And for me, that would always ignite me with the superpower of the power of now. And once I had that power of now, I wasn't thinking about how hungry I, I really was or when I would get surgically hooked up or when I would just be able to go to college or all the what ifs that were rolling through my brain. Because if I planted myself in this moment, um, I could find something uh, to, to ground me and, and feel grateful for. Um, so, you know, creativity really um, was a way to see the world uh, differently um, and those, those five senses. So that energy that you were feeling that I actually feel through your elbows and your wrists um, in your body, that was also a way for me to reframe any emotions that I, I was feeling, any unpleasant, you know, 
grief and, and anger, if I could just kind of objectively think, oh, I'm not anxious, this energy in me, it just feels constricted or tight. Take a moment and, and look at that list and that energy that you were feeling in, in your arms right now or anywhere in your body. See if you can find one of these words that describes it. There are more pleasant sensations, there are more unpleasant sensations. Um, but once I was able to get the uh, opinion out of, out of how that sensation was or, or label it as a, you know, grief or anger, one of those um, words that we're very used to saying and just objectively find something physical about it, then I could do something with it. Um, and that was really um, a way to not be so down about everything I was experiencing. It, it turned my life into something that could have felt very victimizing um, to something uh, very, uh, very empowering. Uh, and I could have control o over what, what I did with those feelings and then nothing seemed uh, so scary anymore. They, they were more uh, approachable. Um, so, um, you know, anxiety. I mean, who has not felt anxiety? If not now, then, then ever. Um, so anxiety makes us do many things. Um, many times they make us avoid um, what we should uh, go ahead and face. Um, but sometimes just facing things is very scary. But when we figure out how to use that energy and when we're able to see it as something that's more approachable, that is, anxiety is energy that can get us from, from day to day or step to step on our detour. And many people ask where I get my energy. Uh, maybe I've just had so much anxiety and I've learned how to channel in healthy ways that I can get through many, many detours to come. Um, and I found ways to really um, find the wonder and the gratitude in, in all of these, uh, all the stimuli that, that makes you have certain reactions to certain things. Um, so it's a, it's a way of uh, reframing um, rather than the energy um, running your life. Um, so, you know, I talk about how creativity is a, is a container um, because many of those ugly feelings can feel like they are very unwieldy and suddenly it's very hard to think clearly or to know where we are anymore. Um, when this, when, you know, COVID hit, suddenly everything we were doing had to be questioned, um, our just everyday routines. Um, and, um, Creativity was a way that I could say, okay, you know what, I'm going to put it into this art or um, cooking is creativity, um, talking is creativity, anywhere where we can take that physical energy and get it out of us in, in some way. Um, humor is one of the coolest forms of creativity. Laughter, and that's a creativity that, that anyone anyone can use, just something that takes whatever you're feeling and shifts it into something else. So, so find your uh, creative container, uh, whatever that is. It can be gardening, it can be sports, it can be uh, reading, it can be meditation, it, it, it can be anything. But find something um, that you feel um, is your container. Um, so I have a, a bunch of um, worksheets that will actually guide you through. I feel like I'm giving you the, the quick kind of spark notes to all this. So, so again, I'll, I have these worksheets, but um, for anyone that does get a copy of the memoir, I, I will send you a whole um, PD. I'm not so great at this. Oh, here we go. So, um, so yeah, so um just smile. It, that was um, something I, I felt a lot um, while I was trying to get through things like, shouldn't I be positive? Shouldn't I put on a happy face? Um, that will never work on a detour. 
if someone just tells you to, you know, be positive and make the best of the situation, I find that like putting on a show um, that that you can't put your heart behind. Um, a lot of people, you know, comment that I'm a very positive person. I really, I'm not a positive person. I think it's taken time to learn how to be a present person. Um, and I think the biggest help were my five superhero senses. Um, but what, you, what I had to do is really find ways to be with the bad so I could finally move to the good. Um, so, you know, you should feel anger on a detour. You should feel, be entitled to anxiety. Um, and once you accept those and bring those in, into your hands, <laughs> then you can shift it and work with it and have a conversation with it um, and, and move through it. Because, you know, those feelings have to go somewhere. And if you don't get them out, they just um, stay in you. And that was something I experienced um, firsthand um, as a teenager um, when I was sexually abused um, by my mentor. I just, all I felt was this anxious feeling in my chest and I tried to stifle it because I didn't understand it. And it just, it manifested it in my body. And only later um, when I ended up finally going to college at age 25, um, did I start studying more about PTSD and learning um, how the body and, and mind are related um, and realize that if we don't talk about these things, um, that's how we get chronic pain and chronic illness and, and just unpleasant feelings that we don't deserve to sit with them. Um, we, we can move through it. Um, it's also why I think, you know, being informed and staying up to date on the news is, is wonderful. Um, but if that's having an effect on us, we also need to be able to um, talk about how it's affecting us um, emotionally um, and know when to contain that and shut that off and then take care of ourselves and, and listen to what's, what's going on in our bodies, which isn't always easy to do when you have external um, stimuli and news you know, blaring at you all day. So it's, it's that kind of going in and out of ourselves that we need to do. Um, so yes, lots of benefits to creativity and, and creativity, you know, also leads to compassion. Um, I experienced this first in Yale hospital, um, when I was in Yale and my surgeries went very wrong. I was just really mad at everyone all day. And I was probably a very grumpy, anxious person, um, and patient in that unit. But suddenly when I could find ways to express what I was feeling, even if I didn't have the words, um, nurses finally understood what was going on. And every day of the four months stay at Yale, I would take one of my paintings and hang it outside the unit. And nurses started wheeling their, their patients by um, my, my cubicle to see what I had created. And it was like, I was having a conversation and that started compassion. Um, right now there's a lot of terrible things going on. And um, I think there's a big need for compassion and understanding. And I think that's why now it, the arts are more important than ever because sometimes words aren't the best way to, to describe you know, who we are right now or what, and what we're feeling. Um, but I feel like um, creativity is something we all resonate with on a, on a really um, primal level. Um, you know, you see a color, you see a painting, and it makes you feel something. Um, so um, I do have some things about diversity. Um, and speaking of all the different stories within us, this is my third uh, resilient skill um, stories. So the first way this was introduced to me was after my coma, my mother would read me all of these inspirational comeback memoirs of you know people like the central park jogger and people that had overcome 
tremendous odds and survived. Um, and she was literally reading this to me as I was coming to, um, not able to get out of bed and still trying to get used to the fact that I'm 18 and I'm in a hospital. What the heck is going on? So I was really pissed off. I, I didn't want to hear any kind of comeback story because that just felt so far from my reality. I, I felt like I was in jail. Um, suddenly, you know, doctors have the right to tell me what to do. I can't just leave and see my friends, um, which is why I, I can understand why a lot of teenagers right now are having a hard time um, understanding, wait, suddenly, you know, the rules are different. You know, I was feeling kind of gypped. Um, but um, it wasn't until later when I started getting better and approaching those steps that I started to remember those stories of the Central Park jogger and these great comeback stories. And then I started looking to those stories as guidance and a way forward. Um, so I realized, you know, if we listen to the stories all around us, they might not click with us at that moment, but we'll remember them, you know, in our subconscious and we'll access them just at the point where we need them. So that's why I think we need to read as many stories as we can from all walks of life, all around the world, from, from people of, of every experience, because those things will sink in at a time we least expect it and at a time we need most. Um, I stories became a huge deal in my recovery um, when things were still very uncertain. Doctors were giving me no guarantee of when my life would change. Uh, we just had a hard time finding a surgeon who could figure out what to do with my with my insides. Um, so I would just mark my time by just pacing around the bookstore marking minutes through like the aisles I was walking around just because things were feeling pretty hopeless. And I just happened to see this big bargain book of, of mythology. And I only stopped to look at it because the pictures were kind of interesting. And as I was looking through every picture, I was noticing there was some kind of journey in all of these stories, whether it was you know, Norse mythology or Greek or Mayan, uh, it was all some kind of person who was in his normal life, whatever normal that was in that society. And then something happened, some aberration where he was pulled from society and taken into this dark period or this struggle. Um, like Jonah and the whale. I saw Jonah was suddenly sucked into the belly of the whale in this darkness. And then in that darkness, the person or figure or animal had to go through all these trials and tribulations and then suddenly he gets spit back into society um, but changed because he had learned something in the darkness and all of these stories were so different yet they all had that theme and I realized that I discovered you know, the archetypal hero's journey I didn't have the words for it until I found out who Joseph Campbell was but as I was looking at all these stories, I realized, you know what? I have no idea how my life is gonna turn out right now, but I can kind of relate to this idea of being in normal life, being in the darkness and having to fight all these bad things. So maybe I can follow this full story and maybe those last few steps of coming back into society, um, but new with a gift to give, maybe that can be me. So I didn't have a path, but now I knew, you know what, I'm going to do the archetypal hero's journey and that will be my roadmap. And so even though I didn't know what was in sight, when I had the idea of this one story trope guiding me through, I felt guided and I felt empowered. Like I was, I was a hero now, I wasn't a patient. And that was really my shift in awareness from being this kind of woe is me patient getting pushed from appointment to appointment to no i'm in the darkness and i'm fighting all these dragons with iv poles and and this is going to be my path i'm going to be a wounded healer and it was a very empowering way to live 
So that is how this skill helped me again and again. I started reading every story I could because they were all training my muscle memory for these are my steps. So, you know, if you don't know the next steps in your life, because none of us do, then you find a model and, and you try to, you try to do that. Um, so I really ended up, you know, numbers four or five, six, you know, 12. These are all Joseph Campbell, um, hero with a thousand faces. Um, that really um, gave me a, a guide back. And, and that's what my, my second TED talk was based on too, that has the steps. Um, so eventually I went back just like the wounded healer does in the archetypal hero's journey. I went back to the ordinary world, but different. And for me, that was, I went back to my passion, musical theater, which I never thought I'd be able to do, having had to learn to walk again and having my voice almost taken away with a tracheotomy and, um, and all these things. I went back to the stage, but differently. Um, I ended up writing a show about my life and, and telling my story for the first time, but in a medium that I loved. Um, so that was my return. And this term detour, I never really thought of it on, as a beautiful detour uh, until this point, because creating Gutless and Grateful, which was my first one woman musical in 2012, I was forced to really think, okay, how am I going to take these random events in my life and put them into a theatrical arc that's going to constitute like a an evening of theater that's not going to depress people maybe uplift them maybe uh show them my path in a in a story um so i really had to come up with you know what is my climax what is my resolution and it was only when i had to put the events of my life in this kind of story form that i realized oh you know what if I didn't go through that, I wouldn't have discovered this. I wouldn't have met this person. I wouldn't have done this. I wouldn't have learned this about myself. And then I realized, because at this point I was still thinking, you know, if this hadn't happened, I would have gone to college for musical theater and done this and that. This was the first time I thought, I can't even say that anymore. I can't even say what I would have done had this detour not happened because this detour has made me who I am. Um, and that was my first TED talk about finding the flowers on your detour that make you who you are. And that was what really empowered me. Um, when I found the gifts of my detour that really enriched my life. Um, and so that's what I hope, and again, Sometimes we don't realize the gifts of our detour until way, way, uh, way, way after. But at least for now, during this detour, I hope we're just able to use that fuel of, of hope to get us from day to day where we can be aware of what flowers we might uh, discover on this opportunity that might have never happened. And when this is all over, whatever over is, um, we can really realize um, how those flowers have, uh, hi screen, how are those flowers have made us who we are. Oh my God, I didn't even realize what time it is. I have so much more to do. Um, that's okay. Um, but because these are worksheets that I have that I will I will give anyone that, um, where my book? Um, but um, my, my third TED talk was about finding the stories that had also grounded me and came before me, um, stories of my grandparents. Um, my grandma was a Holocaust survivor at 18, uh, which was the same age that I was in a coma. So I ended up using the power of stories to find out more about her story, um, to give me a path through. And so what I'm saying with that is really listen to the stories all around you now, um, especially now. Um, there are so many stories from people um, and maybe it just takes a simple, you know, how are you or a simple text or phone call. Um, connect with others in any way you can because you never know how what they have to say might make an impact um, on you. 
Um, and I, I tried to do that as much as I could um, to help guide me through my own um, detour. So again, these are all um, steps I have, um, detour navigation sheets. Um, but, um, but I realized all of this was um, how a detour can lead to unexpected treasures. Um, I'm just going through this quickly um, because I want to get to my uh, fourth and final resilience skill. Yeah, gratitude. Um, so just like hope is not just, oh, have hope and things will get better. Gratitude is not the resilience skill of, you know what, just be thankful this happened to you. Um, you'll find the blessings. You, you got to work for this skill a little bit, but it, it was one of the skills I needed most. Um, so the story behind this is I premiered my one woman musical, Gutless and Grateful in 2012 um, after 26 surgeries. And I was feeling great and even tap dancing on stage again. Um, four days after that, ironically on election day, um, I had my 27th surgery um, because Everything was fine, but I had a few medical kinks that a surgeon was willing to see if he could fix. Um, and any surgery with me is especially a risk be, just by the nature of my anatomy, but I wanted to give it a try. Um, that turned into a disaster. It was three emergency surgeries in eight days. And you have to imagine, going on stage, singing about how I'm done with this and I'm triumphant and I can conquer the world, then being back in a hospital a week later, so weak. And again, I couldn't eat or drink again. That was taken away for a few more months. And I felt like I was in the twilight zone trying to tell nurses, wait, no, no, you don't know what I really do. I was just doing a show about this. Um, and so I was just like Yale Hospital. It was a huge detour and I felt really hopeless. And plus I had already had food in my system for so long. I was eating now and loving it. And now doctors were telling me because I had openings in my system, they couldn't figure out. I had to go without eating or drinking again. So mostly I was really hungry because now I knew what food was. Um, so I needed something to do. Um, so I just started making gratitude lists. I, every day I, I made a list from A to Z and I made myself write something I was grateful for, for every letter. Uh, this is the first one I did. And it really was not to be grateful. It was because I needed to keep my hand busy. As you can see from all my art and things, I, I need to be kept busy. <laughs> so I did this for every day for months, um, just, just to pass the time. But what I noticed, ha, one day I'll get good at my screen. Come on screen. Yes. What I noticed is that as I was keeping this, these gratitude lists, I noticed certain themes start to emerge. Um, I realized that the little things I was writing, even if they were stretches, because I was really trying to get every letter of the alphabet, um, they were coming from a larger place. Whatever I was grateful for that day, it was coming from what my values were. Um, like if M was for mom, oh, family is important to me. T was a uh, tree out the hospital window. Oh, right, nature's important to me. Um, S was for song a nurse is playing on her phone. Oh, right, theater and creativity is important to me. And so that creativity um, and those, those values um, reminded me that, you know what, even with this medical stuff, I'm still me. Whatever they're trying to figure out in my body right now, which is a total mess, um, I'm larger than these circumstances because my values have always been there. So that's why you know, when people ask, what's the first thing I can get started with on these resilience skills? I say, make an A to Z list of gratitude and just make yourself do it, make yourself fill up from A to Z really quickly every night and just, um, just see what comes up because your values will steer you no matter where a detour takes you. Um, they come from that larger place. And coming out of that hospital, I did not have surgeries. I had more medical questions that I'm honestly still trying to figure out, but 
I remembered who I was. And that was the first time I came out of a surgery where it didn't feel like my circumstances took over my life. Um, and I hope we can all come, come out of this. Um, I'm sure we found, you know, pros and, and cons to all this. We've all had losses and we've all had gains, but I hope we can come out of this. Um, finding that our values have still are still the same. And if anything, maybe some are stronger. Um, maybe we, we've learned some things and, and found some flowers. So, so that's, that's what I would say. And oh my God, the time. Um, but I ended up from, from my detour, I ended up after um, this 27th surgery um, and those values had showed me that I was larger than what had happened to me. I just said, you know what? Even though things are so uncertain right now, I'm going to do three things based on what my values are. I'm going to start touring my, that one woman musical again. <laughs> and this was, I had to learn to walk again and everything. Um, I was going to reapply to college and that's how I ended up starting college at 25. Um, and then, um, I ended up graduating at age 30 and, and now I'm in grad school for interdisciplinary arts and, and social justice. But um, I ended up touring Gutless and Grateful and still do in a world uh, beyond social distancing one day um, as a mental health um, and sexual assault prevention program. Um, because I, I talk about how, um, you know, I wasn't really able to understand what was going on um, until I, I used these uh, skills to, to help me. Um, and I find college students are at a point in their lives where things are uncertain and, and they're trying to figure out uh, what to do with these detours and, and how to approach them. Um, so um, yeah, so this is um, so my art. And, and this is the message I, I wanna leave you with. You know, there's no one path to a detour. There's no right way to get through this. Um, but I think the best way to get through and find answers is to just find the most immediate flower that you see right now. And then the next moment, the next flower. And one day you'll get to that clearing and you might not know until you're actually there. Um, but that was what I found. And, you know, as detours keep happening, that's what I have to keep finding one flower at a time. Um, what I ended up doing was, um, I started with a little fancy hashtag love my detour and I just set a call out to people. Um, hey, you know, if you've had anything change in your life um, and it's led you somewhere else, um, write me about it. I'd love to hear. And I ended up getting stories from people all, all around the world. Um, many people would say, you know, I have a detour, but I can't say it gotten me to a certain place, so I can't really write about it. And I would tell them, you know, just, just write about the detour and just see where that takes you. And what they'd always say is, you know, I'm so glad I just started writing about it because from the writing, I realized, oh, that's how I met this person or that's how I did this and, and that's made me who I am. So I'd also say, start writing about it. You know, set a timer if the idea of journaling intimidates you. So you're just gonna write about what's going on right now for three minutes and see where that goes. And I think writing, um, especially by hand, if, if any of us have the patience for that now, um, we can really, um, it gives us a chance to reflect um, and see you know, things we, that this has really um, you know, thought helped us do. Um, and um, I think, yes. Um, so, oh my God, we, we have very little time, um, but um, I want, if anyone wants to stick around for questions, I'd love to answer a few. Um, let me see how I get to the um, participant box. Let's see. How do I get back? Come on. Oh, here we go. One thing I'm wonderfully terrible at is um, technology. And I'm also going to um, put the information in here too if you want to um, send me an email privately or um, I have the information on getting my book and um, 
for anyone that does, I'll, I'll send you all, all these worksheets. Um, and and I, I can eat now, I, I must say. Um, I can eat now, I, I'm good. Um, and um, I also have to say too, um, I have a link to, um, I started selling some of my artwork as masks and I, on Redbubble um, that have some of my artwork and uh, they're really comfy, but you can uh, check those out too. Sorry, I had way too much fun designing those. So I have plenty of those, but what's my favorite thing to eat now? Okay, cheese. I'm obsessed with cheese. Anyone that knows me knows that I'm always walking around with a bag of Ziploc uh, cut up cheese. Um, because um, the thing is with my imperfect system, I, I don't absorb everything. Um, so I have to eat a lot, um, but I don't really mind that at all. Um, and one thing that I realize, especially on hot days is um, having a sip of water and being able to have a sip of something. I remember those days where I would just be taking walks outside, looking at people, sipping like a bottle of water. And to me, they would look like a Baywatch like model, like in the sun. I would just look at that thinking like, when can I have that? I even bought like spray bottles and like flasks and like would make my own water toys, just like visualizing that day for me. So there are some things that you never forget. Um, and every sip of something I take still, still tastes like the first. So there is some gratitude. And that's also my, my call out to people too. Um, there, believe it or not, when this period is over, there are things we're going to miss about this time. I'm sure many of you, if you want to write it all, have, have found um, opportunities that, that you haven't had, whether it's through Zoom connecting with someone or whether it's the time to just unplug and have that space um, and that time. And before you know it, believe it or not, you know, things are going to go back to normal and we're going to be commuting and living our busy lives. And we're going to long for these moments of peace and quiet. And what's so important to know is you can still uh, take those moments with you. Um, so that's why take now as a learning experience. When, when I'm saying going moment to moment as a way to get through, um, also harvest those moments and keep them. So when things do get back to your busy lives, uh, you can really um, take that time and have those moments um, anywhere. Um, let's see if there are any other questions. I don't want to keep you, oh, I found you. Um, if there are any other questions, and then while I'm waiting for questions, I, I want to say um, one other thing. I think many of us are nervous um, about, you know, when things reopening and, and people um, kind of just going out and, and not wearing masks and, and things like that and people being um, over eager. So I just, my call to action is just everyone stay safe because everything can pass and it may seem like things aren't fair. You know, I talked about when I was coming out of a coma, I had never been sick my entire life. So I wanted to like kick these surgeons and be like, let me out. I should not be here. I should be in college, in high school with all of my friends. And I would have if I had a choice um, because being in the hospital was not the joyful, uh, gratifying answer, but it was the safest, it was the healthiest um, answer for me. Um, so sometimes I try to think of myself at 18 um, and think about what teenagers must be going through and what, what many of us must be thinking that, you know, it's been a long time. Um, so sometimes we do have to, as we all know, we have to sacrifice, you know, short term um, enjoyment for, uh, for the greater good, but um, it's worth it and there are ways to find joy. Um, I got a message, what, what, who has been the greatest inspiration in your life? Oh boy, greatest inspiration, I can't, I can't give you one. <laughs> but I can name, um, I, first of all, <laughs> I gotta say a few. Um, my family, I'm very lucky that I had a very solid foundation um, growing up. Um, and um, they, 
even in the hospital, they were the ones that were, you know, playing guitar and making a joke out of things that people thought we were crazy about. And um, my father, um, who was a doctor himself, trying to find doctors all over that would look at me to try to hook me up when every doctor had given up. Um, also, um, I, I want to say to any musical theater people, um, the creator, Tony Award winning creator of Spelling Bee and Falsettos, um, William Finn, who has always been my musical theater god. Um, I just did a podcast which was released today about his album. Um, when I was 15, I wrote him a huge fan letter saying how obsessed I was with him. Um, and this, I didn't really know much about his own health issues at that time, just his wonderful musical falsettos. Um, and um, he ended up calling me at 15. <laughs> um, I took a picture of his number um, and put it in my scrapbook. Um, my mom ended up finding that scrapbook during my coma, calling him. Um, and Bill Finn came to visit me for my high school graduation in the hospital and has continued to reach out to me and been such an inspiration. Um, and for anyone that's seen any of his work, um, he's someone that has almost lost his life um, and been in the ICU and had you know, a brain tumor. Um, and But his way of turning creativity into humor um, that's authentic um, and a way through is really inspiring. Um, and that's my call to that we, we all have to find ways to laugh. Um, finding a distraction during this should not be looked down upon. You know, the distractions, the things that make us laugh are a way to release whatever pent up, whatever we're feeling and, and turn it into something else. I got, I got a message. Um, how do you order the book? You can order it through my website or Amazon. I just type, type it in. And what do I do when I get tired? That's a wonderful question. Yeah, I think it's the only question I don't have an answer to. Um, I, I do have a lot of energy and I honestly, I'm still trying to figure out where I get it from and uh, what to do with it. Um, <laughs> but sorry, I, I don't have an answer. Um, what do I do when I get tired? I guess that's good that I don't have caffeine. But anyway, um, if there's any other questions, I, I don't want to. Um, oh, and hi, phone. Um, and what's the main message of my book? That's a good question to end on. Listen, follow your detour. Um, you don't have to know where the clearing is and when it will happen. Um, but one step at a time. There are so many cliched free phrases like this too shall pass and be in the moment, um, be here now. But really like be here now until it's not a cliche, until you really believe it. Because right now, everything in this very second is good. Um, there, there is always something good. And um, that's all. My book has perspectives from everyone in my crazy life so uh and singing tree my painting so um yeah that's all um but um but thank you all so much please reach out to me um i think we're all longing for connection me included so um send me an email send me a note social media and um get my book and um thank you so much oh for anyone in new york i'll be performing again we pushed the date back to next um, April. Hopefully we'll be able to get back in person at 54 below. Um, but um, thank you guys so much. Thank you, Amy. That was amazing. You guys are amazing. That was great. All right. All right. Um, yeah, if anybody uh, didn't see the um, the stuff in the chat about how to order her book. I think we'll put it up uh, on our Facebook or on our website. So uh, look for that, but uh, do try and get that book. And uh, thanks everybody for coming. I'm gonna make uh, dinner now. <laughs> awesome. All right, take care everybody. Thank you so much, Amy. We appreciate your, your inspirational story. Thank you.